I'm John McKee, editor of Messianic Apologetics. This is Messianic Theology Explained. At least, we hope so. Hebrew versus Greek Mindset. I think it is safe to say that just about every Messianic person, at least at some point, has encountered a teaching or some kind of commentary which has stressed that believers need to have a Hebrew mindset, which is opposed to the Greek mindset. And this has been something which has been taken any number of different ways. Sometimes it's been taken in the direction of stressing a foundation in the Tanakh, the Hebrew Scriptures, and some kind of an involvement with Second Temple Jewish perspectives. In other cases, it can be taken in the direction of demeaning the inspiration of the Greek Apostolic Scriptures or the New Testament, and how most, if not all, of evangelical Protestant theology is to be dispensed with as Hellenistic. So that is a huge window of what Hebrew versus Greek mindset can involve in different teachings you are likely to encounter. Now, the biblical story as seen in both the Tanakh and apostolic writings, is one where ancient Israel was a part of the ancient Near East and intersected with other civilizations, whether it was the Israelites in Egypt, the Israelites in Canaan, the exiles taken away to Assyria, the exiles taken away to Babylon, the exiles returning from Babylon and having to deal with the Persian uh, authorities. Likewise, the Second Temple Jewish community intersected with the classical civilizations of Greece and Rome out in the Mediterranean basin. So the biblical story does involve other ancient civilizations and other worldviews. And you need to be aware of those worldviews so you can properly understand Holy Scripture. On the surface, recognizing that there is an Hebraic worldview seen in the Tanakh Scriptures, that there is a Greek or a Hellenistic worldview encountered in classical philosophy, is not incorrect. However, when you have possibly heard a teaching or a commentary Stressing, you need a Hebrew mindset, not a Greek mindset. How much specificity was offered regarding what a Hebrew mindset or a Greek mindset actually was? How much engagement was provided with Second Temple Judaism, rabbinics, ancient classical philosophy, or is Hebrew versus Greek mindset some kind of a sound bite designed to guide or perhaps even manipulate an audience? It is not inappropriate to suggest that people in today's Messianic community need a better framework to understand things which are Hebraic or things which are Greek or Hellenistic. And I have two main examples for you to consider. The first one, uh, which is quite commonly known throughout biblical studies, involves the concept of peace. This is something I was taught when I was in seminary, when I took Old Testament theology and New Testament theology. Peace is something which we all desire as God's people. It's something we believe has been imparted to us because of our faith in Yeshua, the Messiah. 
In Hebrew, the term peace is shalom. In Greek, the term peace is arene. And if you go to some detailed lexicons, you can see that there are varied approaches to both shalom and arene. Shalom means something a little more involved than just peace. It involves total harmony, tranquility between God, human beings, nature, God's creation. It's something which Adam and Eve were to experience in the Garden of Eden, and it was ruptured due to the presence of sin. So when we talk about Yeshua as the Sar Shalom, the Prince of Peace, these are the kinds of things which we should be experiencing to some degree in our relationship with the Lord. In a classical context, the Greek Erene, for the most part, simply meant an absence of conflict or war, which is, of course, a good thing. We don't like conflict. We don't like war. But Arene, in a strictly classical context, did not necessarily take on all of the same qualities of shalom. Yet, when you see peace referred to throughout the apostolic writings, the New Testament, Arene is used with much of the background of shalom in mind. Irene, as it appears in the teachings of Yeshua and the apostles, carries with it much of the Hebraic understanding of shalom. And the reason we know that is because in the Septuagint, the ancient Greek translation of the Hebrew Tanakh, shalom was rendered as Irene. And so frequently the Septuagint is used as a bridge a, an ancient Jewish Greek translation of the Hebrew Tanakh to better understand some of the Greek employed in the apostolic scriptures. Now, of course, in our life of faith, while we urgently pray for God to demonstrate shalom, to provide shalom, total harmony, tranquility, peace between us and him and creation around us and our fellow human beings, realistically, sometimes a reine, an absence of conflict or war, might be all we're going to get. A second major example for us to consider regarding Hebraic, Hellenistic mindset, worldview, concerns Acts chapter 17 and the Apostle Paul's interactions with the Epicureans and Stoics at the Areopagus, Mars Hill, in Athens. And this is something which is frequently brought up in discussions involving death, the afterlife, and the resurrection. Because it is not uncommon, especially in the independent Hebrew Roots movement, to hear that, well, the Greeks believe that at death, your soul escaped the body and went to heaven to live with the gods. When you encounter Acts 17, you quickly see that there was no uniform belief among the ancient Greeks or Romans regarding death and afterlife expectations. The Epicureans believed that People only got one shot at life on earth. And so your purpose for living was to experience as many pleasures as you could because once you were dead, that was it. No afterlife, no kind of existence afterward. The Stoics, on the other hand, they actually believed when you died, you went into sort of a reincarnation. Your energy was reabsorbed by the universe, the consciousness, whatever, and that you would actually be reincarnated into a future selves. Likewise, as we know from studying Hellenistic philosophy, 
Platonic dualism, so some of the philosophy of the figure Plato, he advocated that the human soul was trapped inside of the prison of the body and was seeking an escape to the great beyond after death. But this is an excellent example. Death, afterlife, resurrection, if there was one, expectations. There was no uniform belief among the ancient Greeks and Romans. Not that unlike today. So the challenge for talking about a Hebraic mindset, a Greek mindset, Hellenistic mindset, something like that is more attention must be given to detail. If people are going to talk about an Hebraic worldview, a Greek worldview, it needs to be substantiated in some more detail with, okay, here are some beliefs which we see present in Second Temple Judaism. Here are some beliefs or ideas present we see in ancient classical philosophy. And you will quickly find that many who have invoked Hebraic worldview, Greek worldview, have likely made things a little too simplistic. More attention to detail is needed by those often invoking some sort of Hebrew versus Greek mindset dynamic. Now, if you would like to know more about this issue as well as related topics, I recommend you consider getting a copy of our ministry publication, Confronting Critical Issues, where many of the things I have just mentioned are discussed as well as other related and important subjects. As always, on behalf of Outreach Israel Ministries, Messianic Apologetics, thank you so much for your continued prayers, support, and donations to all of our ministry efforts. We couldn't do this without your help. We'll see you again soon with another installment of Messianic Theology Explained. And please, if you have a particular topic or question, we have a growing stack of index cards of things to talk about. God bless you. Shalom and take care.